before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful hi so it's monty here for this episode of on farm the food agriculture and rural matters podcast i know all of you who listen are Well, a lot of you are podcast buffs, but personally, as I've said before, I'm a bit of a book buff too. I enjoy my books and I enjoy speaking to authors and what better way to do it than over the podcast. Today, we've got a guest with us who I've got two of his books sitting here. I'm so excited to have a chat with him. I think this is going to be brilliant. My name is Patrick Laurie. I'm a hill farmer from Dumfries and Galloway. And I've got a real interest in conservation, a real interest in uh, land use, land management in the uplands, and I keep and breed a herd of pedigree Riggett Galloway cattle. Patrick, how are you? I'm I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, aside from massive technical issues trying to get online to join you, yeah, absolutely fine, thank you. Is that because of the wilds of Delbiti, or what's the technical issues with you? Um, There's no internet connection to the house here, so everything has to run through a mobile phone, so it just makes... Just makes life that much more exciting, Monty. Just never quite know what's going to happen when you're doing stuff online. If you fall off the end of the mic, Dave's here too. So we'll, we'll we'll just finish this conversation with a chat with Dave. Dave, you can just mainline. That's fine. I don't think I know as much as Patrick does about conservation, though. So we're better <laughs> off talking to him. What I wanted to start with is is kind of your 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 background, Patrick, and how you got into it because you're a bit younger than me. And you, you've pitched off with a book and, you, for example, your black grouse here. The whole thing chimes so well with, like, me growing up. My fears, our losses, the farm here, etc., as to what we faced with losses of, of environment, species, etc. And I think it's just a great thing that you've done. You know, some old ecologist, old scientists or whatever, you have got this nailed for people in my generation there we go tell us about it where did it come from it's been a massive it's always been a really really important part of my life not only farming but all the stuff that goes along with farming including conservation and i don't really see much of a line between those two really and also very specifically an idea of place where i'm from as far southwest as you can go in scotland and then east a bit is where i am and it's a part of the country that (laughs) Yeah, just nobody ever looks at, nobody ever talks about really. Um, And growing up with a very traditional lowland Scottish background, it doesn't sound like it when when I'm talking, but that's very much sort of in my my hardware. I was really seeing huge change that's been happening around here in Dumfries and Galloway over the last 20 years. One of the things that, uh, it kind of struck me even in my mid-20s, I suddenly looked at it and thought, the whole world's turning mm. upside down here and and nobody's is nobody going to say anything about this and so i went around a little bit speaking to people who were sort of kind of like-minded people and it suddenly occurred to me actually there's that awful moment i don't know whether you you you'll have had the same where you suddenly look up and think it's fine the grown-ups have got grown-ups are going to take care of this and then you suddenly think oh god we're the grown-ups and actually we're the only people who are going to be able to do anything about any of this and I don't know, I've written about big topics that I'm not sometimes the best qualified person to talk about them. I've been farming for years and years, but there's loads of people who know more about farming, loads of people who know more about conservation than me. But I had this conversation with my dad where I said, actually, what, what qualifies me to write down any of this and to actually sort of set up a bit of a marker here? And my dad said, wouldn't the worst thing be that nobody did it? And actually... 
at least if you if 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 you did something, if you're so wrong, it might inspire the right person to come and put you right. But and that's a great vote of confidence from my dad there. But there was also this terrifying moment where I thought, there's no backstop here. I'm the I'm the backstop, um, and that that I suppose gave me confidence to jump into bigger issues, which maybe to start with I had no claim on. Maybe now I've got a bit more of a claim on. But as I say, I'm. I'm I'm a I'm a pygmy next to some of the people I work with. So um all of that stuff coming together as it did at the right moment. Well, I had a terrible moment, but what turned out to be the sort of the right moment to generate a lot of these discussions and get people people say, Oh, all you ever talk about is Galloway. I agree that's all I ever talk about is Galloway. I don't have necessarily big qualifications to talk about anywhere else and 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 if people complain that i'm writing too much about farming and conservation in galloway i would say no one else no one else is doing exactly it. so so that's... exactly and that again is just coming back to why it's important because at the end of the day who else is doing it but never mind that what, what we face especially if you wear the farming hat for a minute here what we face is quite often um opinions etc from conservationists who come in and tell us about the world as they see it but they don't have that background. They've not from there. They're not, you know, and I think it's just how valuable for someone to be there experiencing it. And as I've banged on, you know, to, to, to sort of catalog that in the lifespan of, of my farming life as well is, is, is so very admirable. Um, Tell us a wee bit about that. You know, you, you kicked it off, but I'm just looking at the black grouse here, for example, you must've, when did you write that book? Yeah, I was, I had no, I had no right to write that book whatsoever. But again, it was another thing that struck me. Nobody's done, nobody had ever written a book about black grouse. Mm. And yet to me, black grouse were something we saw every day on the farm. They were a big deal back then. And they meant a lot. My father and my grandfather loved to see them at displaying in the spring. I mean, they were, they were around all the time and they they would shoot them on farmer's days. I mean, they were never, they were never sort of fancy game birds nope. that you'd pay to go and shoot. There'd be a, you'd get half a dozen neighbors together and you'd walk up in the afternoon and then everybody would go to the pub. It was yep. that sort of shooting, which is my kind of, my kind of shooting really. I'm not, I'm not a big one for, mm. well, I couldn't afford to do the fancy shooting. Um, and then suddenly they were gone. And the amazing thing about black grouse is you can have, huge population of black grouse and they can all be gone in five years and and again nobody we'd had these everybody had grown up for generations grown up around these birds and suddenly they just weren't there anymore and when at the time certainly when you looked up information of black grouse the only thing you could get was conservation guidance pamphlets stuff that blamed farmers stuff that blamed foresters stuff that basically said we were the problem and nobody saying well fine it's late november and it's a suddenly a bright afternoon and you've got a chance to ring your mates and have them round what what are we going to do we used to go out and shoot some black grouse and now so uh, that's a that's a, that's a small example of it because often as well when you open the windows first thing on an april morning you get used to hearing black grouse all the time and suddenly you don't hear them it's a million percent say the same with what happened with us with gray partridges Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, there were grey partridges. There were grey partridges, grey partridges, and maybe a couple of times a year, uncle and co would go and, you know, there'd be a, a, a little walk around any stubble and there would be grey partridges and we'd have a shoot. Now, yep. did we, did we bollocks that up? Was it our fault? But it, we, we maybe didn't have the understanding. It's now, it's now time to say maybe we did get these things wrong. Or maybe in the environment got it wrong, or maybe the forestry got it wrong, or whatever. But we are the people on the ground, and we are the people trying to at least now make a difference. Yep. And 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 what isn't captured quite often is we're the ones directly experiencing it. And I read something really interesting at the end of last week about this guy who said, "I'm not worried about climate change. I'm not worried about biodiversity loss. I'm worried about the fact that my crops." didn't produce a huge amount last year and i'm and i'm worried about the fact that i don't have curlews or whatever yeah. it was and he said these big issues that we hear about all the time on the news don't mean anything until you apply them to your day-to-day yeah. -day life yeah. and suddenly oh my god they become real and that's why writing about them i was kind of thinking to begin with am i just writing local interest stuff like stuff for the local interest shelf in the bookshop and that's why i've been really surprised then people 
everywhere have resonated to bits and pieces that I've written about it, not because they care about Galloway or, or me or Curlews or anything. It's because what I've been trying to do is put a face on yeah. these things. And, and we are all, whether it's sparrows, whether it's turtle doves or whether it's anything, we're all dealing with these kind of things every day. And fine, we don't always necessarily have the answers, but it doesn't mean that we're not slightly having those moments where we suddenly go, oh, that, that's gone. That that's gone and and that's not and that's not coming back and that's that to me is something that's really worth going large going large on and, and talking about getting people to talk and about. you went large on it because you know we're talking about the black grouse book here which was something as you say 20 years ago but native your next one that's a story what a story you've written there you've encapsulated you know not just about the curlew and the, the wildlife but what a story about the locality what a story about the communities what a, you know it's it's a fascinating read you should be so proud of that it I, i'm i'm glad you i'm glad you said it i'm glad you put it that way around because as i say i said earlier i'm not an ecologist i don't know latin terms i don't really understand tiny details of bird ecology would you like to or you know i i don't think you need to i think the importance is talking about it in the language that we want to read so i the first one of the first drafts of the book was me trying to write a bit of a ecological guide mm. sort of thing and it was it was it was crap because I'm the wrong person to do that and as soon as I started to say do you know what that's just one way of looking at this but actually here's here's my way of looking and here's my my community's way yeah. of looking at these things and this is um this is a bloody difficult place to work culturally very difficult very isolated there's small communities of people, people working long hours without seeing anybody for days after days after days. It'll be the same with farming everywhere. But I think we've got a particular edge on misery here <laughs> that needed to come out in it. And it didn't need to be. And I was quite keen as well that it wouldn't end up being a lovey dovey story where everything was all right in the end. I mean, the reality of what we're up against in a lot of these a lot of these issues is is really is really not great. And so that's why bringing the people into it and making it a human story and a farming story was, it seemed like the obvious yeah. way to go. And aside from anything, being lazy, when you said, would I like to be an ecologist? No, I'm too lazy. I can't be bothered going to learn all that. I'd much rather, I'd much rather tell you what I do know rather than have to go out and scrupulously learn it all. Um, but putting those people in was much more path of least resistance for me. And as soon as I really got into the rhythm of doing that, I was suddenly like, oh, right, that's what this book's supposed to be. That's what this is supposed to be about. Could you give us the elevator pitch for Native? Just because Monty's obviously right into it and knows all about it. But for people who, who aren't aware, uh, what's the sort of three-line plot synopsis? Um, idiot boy attempts to engage with landscape through the medium of agriculture, realises that it's bloody difficult and things don't absolutely don't go according to plan. But third sentence is kind of makes peace with um, the idea of change and loss and the important things that we need to really hold on to. You've tackled that from, you know, all of those angles. You've tackled that from, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing on the farm until this. I didn't really know what I was going to do with these birds until this. I didn't even know what I was going to do with the family until this. And you've, you've just wrapped it all up really well. Um, I think I think it's a genuinely... You know, is a book of here. I am blowing smoke up the backside of our guests again. Dave, shoot me down for it. But I think it genuinely is a yeah, book Jeremy Paxman. Of, you ain't. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I, I could I could listen to this all day, Monty. Keep keep going. You I'm keep going. no, I'm I'm happy. I want I want you know people to listen to this and then go and read the book and things because I think it's genuinely a book of our time. Uh, it's a book of our time telling like our story. Um, I, that's that's the way I feel about it. What's interesting is, I mean, the book it's now been five years since the book was written. Um, for people who haven't read the book, it's got uh, a number of characters, a number of people sort of dip in and out of the story, and none of them are. So I'm a I'm an awful liar, and none of the people in it are entirely themselves. And a lot of the story is compressed or kind of reorganized in ways. But Sani, there's a character called Sani who is the sum of maybe two or three different people who were around at the time and, and were kind of. I mean, I was trying to keep it, trying to keep things moving. You don't necessarily care whether it was Sani or Tam yeah, yeah, or Ronnie that, yeah. that that said these. Um, 
trying to make it, I'm always trying to make the story as simple and as readable as possible, but nothing in life is simple or readable. And and there's always going to have to be a bit of reshuffling and a reorganizing of certain bits. But I find that really encouraging that attitude that I was trying to catch with that character, Sani, that old, what would he have been mid to late seventies, born and brought up on the farm, remembers as a boy working horses, that generation to me, those were the people I grew up around and wanted to be absolutely wanted to be there was nothing that those guys didn't know um to really get into them and their lives now and that's one of the things i found myself at a bit of a dead end trying to do it because the more i've written the more i really want to get under the skin of those old guys and part of me thinks you can't now you you yeah. just can't as much as i'm trying to bury myself in in this project and this farm and and really sucking on some of the upset of it I always know that this is 2023. Yeah. I could sell the farm and the cows tomorrow and go and live in Edinburgh. Yeah. I mean, I, I I don't have to be yeah. here. So it's always my choice is a choice that they never had and making their peace with the landscape and making their peace with what in lots of ways now you'd say would be very difficult, harsh lives. They just, they just sucked it up because that was, that was, that's what nature had served them. So when I'm sort of sitting there trying to imagine what it would be like to be them, they don't make people like that anymore. You touched on it earlier in the sense that, like, we are the adults now. There was actually probably a time, and, and this probably, this sounds, I don't know how to say this properly, but in there was been there was a time when farming didn't really have to be so much of a kind of adult concept as faced with the wider world issues, etc., and and all of this climate change or whatever it is issues that we face you know they they could farm and that was pretty much it and then they could you know live their life out with the farm and that was it we've got this thing to face and we we, we either stick at it and get on with it or we or we can't totally yeah and i think now even so when i say the book was five years old and there's bits in it about starting a family i've now got a three and a half year old son oh um, congrats well done I, I didn't know that wasn't aware of that <laughs> yeah well, there you go. There you go. Um, one thing, the generations are massive, but one thing, the, the difference between these generations is massive. What you say in farming also applies to being a being a person. Yeah. In as much as I like, I I spend an awful lot of time with my son, and I play with him a lot, and he's he's always around me in a way that I maybe don't quite remember so much with my yeah, dad yeah. because that just wasn't the expectation. And even his dad before my dad, my dad used to call his dad sir. Yeah. Part of me is like, where, the, where where's that? That's like Von Trapp family or something. That's <laughs> that's absolutely nuts. Um, but but each generation is being asked to do. I suppose my point is each generation being asked to do, being given a slightly different hand of cards yeah, to yeah. play. Yeah. And, and 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 I've been really conscious now of not really having a model. I mean, what does a farm dad look like? In as much as I used to just be left with my mum while my dad went out to do lots of this yeah. stuff. Whereas what does what does a conservation farmer yeah. look like? What does a so we're all we're all maybe being encouraged to juggle a bit more than we used to, and and we're not surprised we're getting it wrong sometimes. Not surprised we're finding it a bit of a challenge. A, mi a million percent. I think I think that is that's probably the story of just about anyone listening to this now. What what are you anymore? You know, it's not. It's never just being a farmer. It's never just being. You know, we've all yeah. And then fatherhood. I'm, I'm I'm so glad to hear that. I didn't realise that. And from the book, you know, I, I realised you maybe had a bit of a um a, a time to get to that stage. So, um, congratulations. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that was that was um yeah that was a that was a difficult difficult whole process to get to get up and running. But when you look at what is expected of us now, it's 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 as I say, it's not difficult that we're slightly grating at the edges sometimes and we're not just not quite sure about stuff. But at the same time, it's always frustrating. I've just been spending, spent weekend before last with a group of friends from school who've all got kids now and are amazing parents. And part of me is thinking, oh, bugger off. That's just absolutely ridiculous. You're so, they've got time, they've got availability, they're, cut, they're just absolutely on, in the zone. Whereas I'm forever thinking, <laughs> oh God, what about the cows? And I've had a sick cow that died while I was away mm -hmm. and just just trying to get off the farm in my yeah, head it's a, yeah, such an yeah, immersive yeah. thing i i, I, I know I, I don't know it's a yeah. it's a it, it's juggling lots we do probably need to chat about off the farm as it were because and you know the, the books are one thing but you are now 
what I would say, you know, you're a respected what conservationist. What hat do you want to wear? You know, you've, you're involved in a lot of different things. What's what else is going on? Yeah. Respected is probably a big word, but active, I would active. I'd be happier with active. active. There you are. Then. Okay. <laughs> Um, through bits and pieces. So I've always had an interest in um, birds. But then again, as I say, I wasn't really sure where the line lay between birds and the countryside or birds and farming generally. So I didn't come at this thinking that I would be a bird person necessarily. Um, but it turns out that over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, an awful lot of farmers want to get more involved in conservation. Um, they're probably a bit sick of being told all the time that they're the problem. They're probably a bit sick of yeah, being shouted at or blamed for stuff and then being given stupid schemes that don't adequately repay the effort involved and don't actually produce more birds anyway, which is the world's biggest turnoff for getting involved in conservation. So um, I do off the farm, I do consultancy. So I work with farms and estates, helping them basically unpack what in Scotland is the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme. I work for Scottish government. I run a project there trying to make sure that future schemes are going to actually work on the farm. So they actually have a bit of road, a bit of road testing and a bit of um, practicality built into them. Um, I think that as people have got more interested in it, there are gaps in moving farmers in the right directions to actually I mean, farmers have been talking about doing conservation stuff since the 80s, the 90s. The difference is now we really, really need it to work yeah. and we can't just keep paying for, for stupid schemes that don't do anything and basically amount to giving you another lever to play the system but not having any vested interest in what, what you're working on. So what it's all bananas. So trying to make sure that it's led, finding farmers who want to do good stuff and then letting them be in charge and that's that's some of the really good stuff that i've done through scottish government and through a project in scotland called working for yeah. waders um <clears throat> it's been quite a difficult i mean we're so entrenched in this pattern that farmers get paid to do conservation that a lot of farmers have just kind of taken their foot off the pedal and, and wait for rspb or nature scott or somebody to turn up and say look we want to do this project for corn buntings or lapwings or any of these things the, the the shift with this is actually I'm now traveling around looking for farmers who already want to do these kind of things and aren't and aren't sitting waiting to be approached but are actually leading it and then trying to work out okay well you want to do this you want to do that you want to do the other what do you need to make that happen and sometimes it's financial sometimes it's technical sometimes it's monitoring sometimes it's logistical stuff it's not straightforward but I think it works way better particularly as well do you know one of the things that's a really telling the really telling aspect of this is sometimes you look at a project and you think right you've got funding to do this for five years what's going to happen after those five years are you just going to stop mm -hmm. because there's no money yeah. in it anymore or is this going to roll it's not to say there won't be money after the five years but are you keen enough on this project to 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 work on curlews or lapwings or anything that we're really interested in here are you keen enough on this so that say there's 18 months where you don't get paid are you just going to are you just going to do this anyway are you now really invested in this is this something you really want to do and it's those projects which they don't run out of money because they always find money because they're always demonstrating success so it takes a bit of a leap of faith and it's a bit of a different approach as i say from just being paid to do stuff but it's also interesting that there's people like you sort of leading that i mean i i i said something earlier about um gray partridges and i remember Going back, well, 10, no, probably possibly longer than 10 years ago, 15 maybe even, when I um, wanted to do something about grey partridges and I got involved with the GWZT and there was the count scheme, etc. But the count scheme was literally about all I could see that I felt, for want of a better way of putting it, comfortable with, you know. Dave will shoot me for this. I'm I'm sort of shooting from the hip a little bit in this in this pod, and I'm going to do that for a wee bit the way I feel at the moment. But there was no way that I'm the sort of person that was comfortable to allow any input from what I see as quasi, and you might even take offence to this, Patrick, but sort of quasi political, like RSPB or whatever. That wasn't happening. That just wasn't my thing. So, Game Conservancy were about the only route there. Now it's much more exciting. There's farmers involved in various groups all over. Um, I've been into uh, in the borders here. There's biodiversity action group. There's lots of things happening. It's all about knowledge transfer. We're all buying into this. And gosh, we must be on a better route now. 
Surely, and you know, you're not you're not um, rattling my cage with that comment at all because I mean, I had for years and years big reservations about aspects of, say, RSPB, say, Nature Scott, say, some mm. of these. And even now, you can work with like it's such a big organization that you never you never work with the RSPB. You work yeah. with the guy, yeah. the the local person, and they might be great and they might be doing fantastic things. Sometimes almost in defiance of head mm. office. And then you have a really good day with them, or you run a really good project with them for six months, and then you turn around and see how it's been communicated, how it goes into their press, how it goes into their PR stuff, and you're like, you've just upset everybody you've worked with all this time because because there's so many different layers to this, and the general public want one story, farmers want another story, and this it gets really bitty. But at the same time, something like, I'm not, not particularly picking on RSPB because there's lots of other organisations like it, but they're in fact, no, do you know what? There aren't any other organizations like RSPB. <laughs> RSPB are just yeah. uniquely well provisioned, yeah. uniquely well tapped in. Their funding is unbelievable. Yeah. In such a way, if you want to do something, you've you've got to work with mm. them. You're not you're not gonna fight them. You're not you're never gonna win. And actually, as I say, for every problem that you encounter working with people like RSPB, there's there's so many people who are absolutely completely on the same page and they're ready to listen, they're ready to work. Even on some of the more contentious things, like um, I mean, around here, it's a big issue. People, people frustrated about a lack of conversation about something like badgers in the south of Scotland. That just does not go anywhere when it when it leaves the farm. That conversation is dead in the water. But but I feel like we're in a position now, Monty, where we, yeah, we've got much better sense of dialogue. And fine, people aren't jumping on board to say we need to do something about badgers, but we're able to actually be heard. We're able to not just feel like we're being shut down as the ignorant farmer, and that that that's encouraging. I think that's that's enormous progress. Well, that is brilliant. That is brilliant because it doesn't go far back at all to the time where, you know, one would be scared to even mention the word badger and 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 potential accusations of all sorts of crime that would be associated. You know, a crime. I use that word because that was oh, you can't even talk about badgers. How could you possibly think that badgers could be guilty of anything? You must be a badger botherer. You know, and there's me being open again, but it's so frustrating and it just, none of it gets us anywhere. None of that gets us anywhere. We have to be. You're not even, I mean, that's not even an exaggeration, no. Monty. I'm sure you know. I mean, around here, they're not, we don't, we don't use the word no. badger. They're black and yeah, white yeah, or they're pigs. Yeah, or, yeah, you, yeah, you don't, you don't, yeah. you don't say yeah. badger. Um, but that's, so badgers is a specific example here, and it's probably at the more controversial mm. end of it. But I do think that we are making a bit more progress along these lines. And as I say, some of the best farmer, not led maybe, but farmer hatched conservation projects that I've been working on, they've been streets ahead of the best of them. And you do get that feeling at the end of the day that these guys are really motoring. They understand what they're doing. They understand how to do it. It's integrated with their farm business. They're doing it partly because it pays them, partly because they want to do it. And and that sense of ownership is really encouraging. And for species, when we started talking about this, my particular focus has been wading birds, which are um, curlews, lapwings, oyster catchers, red shanks, snipe, mm-hmm. classic sort of farmland species, yep. um, have done just so incredibly badly, particularly in Scotland, but across the UK over the last 20 years, 25 years, they have absolutely bombed. And the parish where I am now has lost something like 98% of its curlews since the mid-90s. Um, that's a staggering yeah. loss for a bird that is big, it's noisy, you know when you've got curlews, they're, they're, they're a, and they arrive in the spring and the lambing, so they have a real sort of association to them. Um, losing those birds, they're not like the lesser speckled something or other. I mean, you, you can lose a lot of birds to our shame perhaps as farmers you can lose a lot of biodiversity and not notice it until suddenly you wake up and go oh my god where's it gone but a curlew you you notice when that's not let's just make this real then for a wee second because you know i'm probably conscious that some listeners to this a lot of people know exactly what we're talking about but maybe someone doesn't um the curlew what's happened where's the curlew where why are we missing curlews where are we on it oh the problem, curlews are caught in a bit of a perfect storm and it varies. The, pro- the the drivers all kind of have come together at once. So there's no one there's no one problem for curlews, really. Um, they're very long lived, so they can live up to sort of 30, 35 years. So they, they always come back to the same place 
where they breed bred last year. So each year you'll get the same birds coming back. The problem has been that they just aren't producing enough young to replace their overwinter mortality. So curlews each year, 90% of curlews will go back next year. And each so as a result, you get a very you, you get a very old, very stable population of curlews that just isn't having any chicks. So a very slow annual decline in numbers is just natural. It's natural with every species. But what you're relying on is a healthy flush of young birds to replace the old mm. birds that you're losing. And those young birds are dying through predation. Foxes, badgers, crows, lots of things will take curlew eggs and curlew chicks. But not just predation, because predation is exacerbated uh, and complicated by um, forestry. Forestry plantations mean that there are probably more predators going about than there might otherwise have been. Um, some people say that pheasant releasing pheasants is increasing the number of predators that are going around. Um, some people say that certain types of farming are increasing the numbers of predators going around. And also uh, uh, early mowing silage will often mow up the nests, even when you really try and avoid it. I mean, I've, do I've, I've hey, done yeah. it and I'm yeah. I'm as keen as anybody on curlews. Um, there's there's just pressure coming in from lots of di different angles. And, and because curlews are big birds, they live for years, they don't need to produce an awful lot of chicks. If they have a bad year they'll walk away and try again. They're not like a lapwing or, or a bird that works on a much faster turnover that really needs to do well every year. Like like swallows. I just had 170 swallows left the farm this mm. year heading out on migration. Like that's insane. Yeah. Um, but those guys won't... The, if they if they didn't do that, they'd be gone. The difference is with curlews is they only need one or two chicks every few years and they'll just stay stable. Things are so bad and so suddenly that... Curlews aren't even meeting their tiny and needs. Again, because you're not needing to tell me this, but just for the listeners, what, what, why is this a tragedy? What's 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 so important about the curlew that we don't lose a curlew? When I say then that curlews are a victim of all sorts of pressures in the, particularly in the on, on farmland, but I mean they're out on the hills, they're out in the moors as well, which is my kind of farmland, I suppose. Um, the way that land use is changing reflects um, a kind of approach to looking after land and taking care of, uh, of of agricultural landscapes that is also changing as we're doing it. So the fact that curlews are going says a lot about what we're now doing with land and, and how we're making money on land and what we're, basically what the market is expecting farmers to yeah. do with land. And to me, there's it goes the reason why it goes much deeper than just oh it's a bird and. I'm afraid the argument about curlews being just a bird doesn't count because curlews are not just a bird. As I say, they're massive. Mm. Their song is amazing. You know when you've got mm. a curlew. They're not just mm. not just another bird. Um, the um, the reason why it's such a tragedy with curlews is that with curlews going, we are also losing a lot of really healthy and traditional ways of, of looking after land sustainably for the future. And that ties in with bits and pieces around um, climate change and um, carbon, even <laughs> carbon storage, carbon accounting, and particularly in the uplands, um, we are curlews. To me, represent all of the all of the really good things that we've already all, that we've always done, and yet suddenly now are finding an awful lot harder yeah, to do. They're a real paint pot species. They're they're there because things are right. They're gone when things are wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's I it's I find it interesting too. Because when I say they indicate it, stuff around climate change and, and carbon storage, that's that's true in the uplands when you're talking about peatland and restoring peatlands, and that's something that I've done work on with farms and estates in the southern uplands here. Um, but almost the opposite is sometimes true when you talk about um, carbon accounting on farms and a drive for greater efficiency, carbon efficiency on farms. Um because they're just ratcheting up that level of intensity. And so farmers then being encouraged to kind of, inverted commas, save the world mm. by farming uh, sustainably mm. are actually, in a lot of cases, hammering biodiversity as a result. Because biodiversity is an inefficiency. If you run it through a spreadsheet and you look at your farm entirely through that spreadsheet, curlews are taking something that you could have had. So why aren't you having that? That, 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 should, have been, that should have been yours. That means then that, like particularly around here, very intensive dairy on the better ground in Galloway, those used to be incredible, super productive hotbeds for curlews. 
you can walk for miles through that kind of country now. Enormous silage fields, uh, monocrop great ryegrass silage fields. That the, there's nothing. There's nothing in there really. There's no birds in there. And you, um, Patrick, and me, and our listeners, we understand it's that that there that comes to the nub of it. That's what I'm talking about. The likes of the RSPB, etc. We're all understanding why the neighbouring dairy farmer has had to do what they've had to do for all sorts of economic reasons, for all sort of carbon footprint reasons, for feeding, for, you know, producing the best cheese, the best milk, whatever it might be, they've had to do it. And it's just sad that it comes at the cost of something like the curlew. But if we can put our heads together and use the right sort of acceptable knowledge, etc., from fellow farmers, maybe, maybe these problems can be met head on and, and, and reversed. There is also a generational mindset in certain respects that, that's willing that's that's willing to willing to for this to happen. Um, not that they don't maybe regret aspects of it, but I mean all of this, everybody's farm is a trade-off between multiple objectives. And if birds one of the things I found really telling is curlews here in Galloway were super abundant for years. They were absolutely everywhere. People of my dad's generation, maybe in their late 60s, are finding it really hard to believe that they could genuinely ever damage curlews. And all they need to, because we've got the Solway Firth three miles away from here, we get huge numbers of curlews from other parts of Europe come here in the winter. All those guys sometimes need to do is hear a curlew flying in the night and they'll say, curlews. Well, there you go. What I can't understand what the problem is. And they don't make that. That, to me, was a really important thing about curlews is they will always nest, not only in the same field, but often in the same part of the field. So if your curlews aren't nesting in that part of the field, they haven't gone elsewhere. They're, they're gone. Mm -hmm. They're dead. They, they're no longer breeding. They don't move. And, and time and time again, I speak to farmers who, with the best will in the world, think that they're doing their absolute best by the species that we're interested in. They'll say, those curlews, they've probably just gone somewhere else. And that's a really difficult thing to bring, because a lot of what I'm trying to do is often nudging people in the right direction and, and, and learning as we go on stuff. But I mean, that requires me to genuinely look somebody in the face and say, you're wrong. Yeah. You're just wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. They're gone. So... I suppose I started this saying that not everybody cares, but 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 the more you know, the more you're able to care, the more you're able to get involved in it. And 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 curlews again, because they're so popular, because they've always been here, I think people are finding it finding it really difficult to get on board with the idea that actually their actions today mean that we're not going to have something tomorrow. Because that's that's silly. It's, Don't be silly. There's always going to be curlews. So it's not like ah uh, yeah they were there. I've, I'm now more intensively farming silage in that ground, but I've got a little bit of a system going on down here, which they might like. So that's where they are now. It's just not that. Once they've gone, they've pretty much gone. They will, they'll move. They'll move to within a few hundred yards. Yeah. But if you find that curlews turn up, the chances are they might be young curlews that are looking to get set up somewhere. And if that happens, I mean, that's the thing. They're so conservative. They'll always want to go back to the same place. So if you didn't have them, and if you've never had them and you suddenly get them, people pray for that to happen. And my God, do everything you can because that's an incredible start. Because as I say, only young birds will be looking for new places. Once they've decided where they're going to be for the next 25, 30 years, they're going to go back to that field as long as they're still alive. Mm. And one of the things here that we've seen um, in Galloway, and I know everybody's feeling slightly if not uneasy, but but increasingly aware of of, of commercial forestry in Scotland, um, in Galloway, this is this is a massive land use change that we're seeing at the moment. Foresters talk about new plantations, new developments, displacing curlews, moving them off somewhere else. Again, that's not a thing. Right. They don't move. What they'll do is they'll try and nest in the trees. They'll fail. They'll try and nest in the trees. And as the trees get bigger and bigger and bigger, they're more likely to be predated. So they'll get killed in the trees. And so that's that's how they end. But in Galloway, I mean, looking even in the brief time I've been farming, when I was first interested in buying some land, the kind of rough hill grazing that I want to put my cattle on used to be 750, 800 pounds an acre. Uh, it's now, <laughs> yeah, it's now 10, 12,000 pounds an yeah. acre for hill ground. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's insane. Yeah. And, and, and farmers locally, a lot of farmers 
average age of farmers in Scotland is pretty high. Average age of farmers locally is probably even slightly higher. And really surprisingly, when you map it out, pretty poor succession planning in terms of young people coming through and wanting to live like their dads did. Now is a great time to check out of farming altogether if you're in a difficult place like Galloway. So it's no surprise we're seeing astonishing amounts of new spruce plantations going in from investment groups, um, foreign investment groups, pension funds, uh, all sorts of people buying up land. We're kind of off the map here, and we don't really know. We don't really we don't really know what's going to come next. And for birds like curlews, it's absolutely game over. And when we come come back to your um, question, why is it been so? Why has it been so dramatic? Why has it been so dramatic? Why are the declines happening in Galloway? Forestry, full stop. But there's lots of other. But that's also yeah. to say, there's lots of other parts of Scotland where there's much less forestry, where curlews aren't. And, and in like the north of England, you can hardly. You need to get planning permission to plant a single tree. It seems sometimes in in the north of England, and yet in lots of places, their curlews are struggling. So it's not just. It's not just black and white. Let's lift things on to another thing that you're passionate about, another topic you're passionate about, and I'm very interested in hearing about, and it's probably a bit more positive just to maybe wrap up on even. Tell us about your cattle, because you've gone down this route of, you know, I'm not just going to go and get um, cattle, hill cattle. I'm not even just going to go and get Galloways. You've gone down this route with these rigets, etc. Tell us a bit about those. Yeah. Um my family's always been really, really keen on black Galloway cattle. And my grandfather won all sorts of prizes in the sixties and seventies and exported black Galloway cattle to Canada and New Zealand and all over the world. And I thought, right, well if I'm gonna get cattle, it's gonna to have to be Galloways, and inevitably it's gonna to have to be black Galloways. And looking to find out more about black Galloways, and I wanted sort of traditional type, the kind of beasts that my grandfather had. Um, I went to visit a few breeders and I went to see one guy who had Rigget Galloways. And at the time, I had never heard of Rigget Galloways. Um, a Rigget Galloway is when they were breeding Black Galloway cattle and kind of creating the breed. Uh, occasionally, they would get these weird throwback cattle, which were always originally part of, historically part of the Galloway herd. But they were always selected against. We all, Galloway breeders wanted black cattle. That's what they wanted. And so when these throwbacks turned out, so they often had a white head, black nose, black ears, and then a black body with a white stripe that runs down the back. So not like a belty Galloway that goes mm. around the belly. It goes down the spine like a Longhorn or or, um, or or a Gloucester. It's like a really old, old genetic trait in lots of breeds of cattle. I found out that there was such a... Th that happened in Galloways. They're called Rigget Galloways. The word is Rigget is kind of like a it's a it's a, an old viking word but it basically means rig it's about the white rig at the top of the back so it's just indicating the rig basically um and they're quite closely aligned with white galloways which everybody loves white Gall well they don't i wish everybody loved white galloways everybody loves belted galloways and yeah, i'm yeah. bored sick of hearing about people talking about belted galloways everybody says oh they're just the best cows in the world if you're from Galloway, you are so over belted Galloways because they're just everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And when you go to other parts of the UK and people say, oh, look, it's belted Galloways. And you say, oh, my God, <laughs> change the record. Um, but so I really liked Riggits because they were a bit unusual. At the time, they were very rare. They still are very rare. I think there's fewer than a thousand breeding animals still really? registered. Right. Um, they don't always breed true. So you uh, two Riggits, I had a Riggit bull and Riggit cows. And they, they're as likely to throw out a white Galloway calf. I love white Galloways. They're just absolutely stunning. Um, they might throw out a solid black. They might throw out all sorts of things. I guess part of the thing is just not really caring too much. You know, you, I, I'm, 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 you can shoot me down if I'm wrong here, but my take on it, I have a neighbour actually who farms belties and, and I know that it's all about this perfect belt, etc. And it's like in any breed, you know, the markings are right. I'm going to say with the rigget, you're probably just happy with decent cattle, cattle that stand up and do a job and the marking or the white or the black or the rig or whatever is probably, or or are you into this? Is it going to be a perfect rig? What, how does it work? To me, it's, it, it's, it cuts both ways right. because you only get the, 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 the rig of the rigget only is expressed in really old traditional cattle. A lot of strange stuff happened with Galloways, as much as they are very pure. A lot of strange stuff happened with them when they were improved in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Those guys, which are Galloways, yep. but they're a more commercial kind yep. of Galloway, they're much less likely to produce the rig. Right. So from, from my perspective, if you've got 
a few cows with rigid markings, you're dealing with the most traditional, right. smallest, short-legged, yep. fat-bellied, square-headed, yep. Yep. really, really old-fashioned type of yep. cattle. I really love, this year I've had two white Galloway calves, one a bull, one a heifer. I absolutely love them. It doesn't really bother me that they're not rigid no, marked. No, no. They are, in yeah. terms of shape, they are absolutely perfect. And maybe next year I'll get one that is not only the perfect shape but the perfect markings. Yeah, that'll be the cherry on the cake. But but I'm not going to lose sleep over, oh, well, you see there's white hairs on that one's <laughs> foot where it shouldn't have been and stuff. You're not out with the tweezers taking out the black hair and the nose and the whatever. No. <laughs> no, no yeah. absolutely not and to be honest once you've got them up on a hook yeah nobody can see yeah. the difference nobody yeah. can see the difference yeah. anyway and is that a thing is that I, I don't know is that is that is that you is that your thing i mean are we are you selling beef in boxes or something like that or how does it work um i um generally sell everything at about 16 months old a store um i've had a few really good pedigree animals that have gone I've had a really nice bull that went to Northumberland. Uh, I've had a few nice heifers that have gone all across the country. But I was in touch with people who were selling, who were buying finished cattle and selling them down at an incredible markup down to London yeah, for yeah. premium markets. Um, that was ace. That was that was really great. And because Riggett's a bit a bit unusual, mm. um, that market was really really keen on it. My problem is because I'm set up as a suckler herd. Yeah, yeah. I'm not very I'm not very good at finishing no, stuff. No, no, no. And this time of year. It's only downhill from here. So if I, so if something's not ready to kill now, and thirty months is coming up, or or, or fine, that the ones that I've sold have been over thirty months. But that's um, <clears throat> if I can't get them fat, if they're not fat now, it's going to be next year before we're even going to get another go at it. So so that's just too unreliable to run anything. I'd much rather sell things at sixty months old and have somebody who knows what they're doing fatten them. It's it's interesting this chat. I know the listeners can't see this, but you know. You get a glow in your eye when you talk about the 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 curlews. You get a big glow in your eye when you talk about the cattle. Um, I, I just sort of as we as we draw a close, what would your grandfather think? You talk about your grandfather. You talk about him with the cattle, etc. What would he think about how you are farming your cattle, your birds, etc.? Um, that's a do you know I've done through stuff and bits and pieces around that book? I've done lots of these sorts of conversations, although never one I've enjoyed quite so much as this, Monty. <laughs> um, but I must say I've never been asked that particularly. I think, in lots of ways, he would think that I was just messing about because um, farming is. He made he made his money farming. His father made his money farming. I'm lucky enough to be able to make money off farm. But then, like you said earlier, everybody makes money off mm. farm, Everywhere whether you've got a holiday cottage or whether you're selling beef boxes or whatever you're doing. There's almost nobody of my generation who's just farming the way that my grandfather used to farm. So everybody's having to think sideways about a lot of this stuff. But I hope, even if he thought that I was getting stuff wrong and being a bit cussed about it, I hope that he would recognise why and I'd hope he'd have an understanding of, I mean, I know that he loved the birds and wildlife that I love. And I know that, I mean, he had loads of options to go. I mean, he was very, he had a very interesting war and he had lots of friends in Africa and he was often tempted to move out to Africa as lots of farmers were in the 50s and 60s. And he never did. He always stayed here. So I think he was anchored to this place in the same way as I am. So I hope that he would be able to look through the mess I make sometimes and say, well, he's he's doing it in order to be in a place that he loves. Can't ask for any more than that. Cannot ask for any more <laughs> than that. There's a message. You know, we're all here. We're all trying our best with what we're doing. We're all trying our best. We've got people like Patrick telling us about maybe some things that could be done easier, helpful, etc. But we're all trying our best. And I, I, that's something that I hope if you're not farming and you're listening to this, you get that message. If you're of the older generation, you appreciate what we're all trying to do. So, Patrick Laurie, what a wonderful chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's been really, it's been lots of fun. <laughs> Good man. With that, as I always say, that's it from me and bye for now.